Um, hello, my name's Owen. Welcome to uh, this uh, SCP session, um, hosted by Fab Lab Plymouth. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I have a first degree in geology. I have a second degree of master's in creative practices for sustainability, which in a nutshell is sustainable design and um, my specialism, one of my specialisms is material ethics. Uh, my colleague Ian is a master glassman. He was a master glassman at the Royal College of Art, where he has a master's degree in something or other. Um, and that's about it as far as what, <laughs> what we do, or who we are. Now, the, as Ian mentioned about the course structure, um, there are six sessions. Uh, this is the first session, which is going to be led by me. And it is an overview of Fusion 360, which is an Autodesk product. Um, next week, there will be a 3D digital fabrication and 3D printing, and that will involve Cura, uh, slicing software, and a piece of software called Slicer. Um, that's led by Ian. Session three is 2D digital design and fabrication using Fusion 360 in Inkscape, and that's for, primarily for laser cutting. Session four, which is led by me again, um, that will be involving selective laser, that's not, that's the wrong uh, printer. Uh, it'll be involved stereolithographic printing, which is resin printing and designing for such machines as that. Um, we'll be looking at probably Fusion, but also again, a bit of software called Preform. Session five, which will be run by Ian, that's on 3D scanning and uh, associated processes. And then finally session six, which will be run by me, and that's on uh, that's surrounded um, CNC machining, uh, computer numerical control machining. Okay. Now every week we're going to expect that you should expect every week to have some kind of thing that you create. Okay. And in this case today, I'm hoping that you're going to create something. Uh, you're going to create something called an STL file. Dot STL a stereolithographic file, and I'll, I'll explain what that is um, later on in the session. Um, and about 70 minutes, we're well, probably less than that now, so 60 minutes, we're gonna have a break for 10 minutes, um, and then we'll reconvene. But first, what I'm gonna start with is, <laughs> first, what I'm gonna start uh, with is fundamental design considerations before we um, actually start exploring what Fusion 360 is, okay? Um, and it's an important one. And uh, firstly, it's like we work, in design, we work using a particular system, coordinate system. Hello. And um, I'm gonna share a screen. You're not gonna actually see much of me. Um, you're gonna see a shared screen. So I'm just gonna share that with you right now. Okay, and in a moment, you should be seeing this screen here, and it's a blank screen. Uh, well, apart from the fact this is the Fusion 360 workspace. Okay, and the reason why I've got it up is because I'm going to explain basically this system of um, coordinates that we use, and it's the Cartesian coordinate system. Okay, now you might be wondering what that is. Well, I'll explain. Everything within this virtual design environment starts off with a datum point. Now, this is, I've expanded this. This is actually like a, a sphere. But in reality, in the virtual reality, this is just a point that exists. And if you gave it a number, because it's based on coordinates, it would have three numbers. Three numbers, not four. Three numbers. And that would be that datum, zero, zero, zero. So everything is measured from there, okay? We'll come into that a little bit more in a moment. Well, I'll just turn it off just for clarity. Now, within this coordinate system, we, have, we work with three axes. We could create others if we want, but for the get-go, we're going to use three axes, and they are the X, the Y, and the Z, okay? Now, in terms of the X axis, where it runs, it runs from left to right, right to left, so that way, and that one's represented usually in color red, 
the white axis, the green axis in this case is to and fro, backwards and forwards like that, towards me, away from me, and so on and so forth. And then you've got the Z axis, and that is vertical, up and down. Now, that's how we work within this lab. It is true to say that the X and the Y are interchangeable in terms of where they lie. We're not going to worry about that, okay? We're not going to muddy the waters any more than it could be, okay? Now, the thing to understand about these axes is that there are, if you can imagine, a point um, can exist within that space, yeah? And those points can take on, they, each point would have three numbers, okay? And that is a measurement relative to its position against that axis. So for example, if I place this point here, anything within here is plus, plus, plus. So any number in there is a positive, okay? So going away from us from that X axis along that Y axis in that direction is a positive. Going upwards is a positive and going to the right is a positive, okay? You might be wondering what this has got to do with anything. It's got to do with everything we do within the lab, within computer-aided design, or in certain this aspect of computer-aided design. Consequently, if you can imagine that these axes divide up a cube, yeah, into say eight parts, you would have eight different zones, yeah? And each zone would have corresponding numbers that follow that kind of pattern. Right, so, so if it's in the bottom, at least one of them will be negative on one side, or right in the very corner, the counter corner there, they'd all be negative. You don't need to worry about that right now, okay? So, now the thing to understand, I'm just gonna turn those off because they get in the way. Now the thing to understand is that we often create 3D designs, even 2D designs, on a plane. And that plane is determined, it's informed by the axes um, that, um, that are part of it. So for example, the, the first plane, like the top plane, so if you imagine you're looking at a desk, you're looking downwards, that would be the top plane. That is known as the XY plane, and there it is, okay? And so that forms through that relationship between the X axes and the Y axes. Okay. Now there are other two other planes, of course. I'll turn that off. You also have the X Z plane. This one can be related to the front. Okay, so I'm looking at the front of a building that could be regarded as the X uh, the X Z plane. Also, it could be the back because it's they're parallel, right? Imagine that. Imagine looking at a cube, a box, and then you've got the YZ plane. This is often regarded as the right hand plane, the right plane, so to the right, but it could be to the left as well. So it could be those sides, okay? Now, when we're using fusion, as I say, it's really important to know about these planes because they directly influence, or they should directly influence where you draw your initial sketches. And I'll explain what a sketch is a little later on. Okay, so you've got these kind of planes in this setup. Okay, now as I was saying about these negative uh, numbers, axes just don't go forward, or I mean, they do go forward, but they also go back. So I'll just draw these one in. There's the, um, the axes labels, and then we've got these guys here too. All right, so in this corner here, everything's positive. Down here, everything's negative in this corner here, down at the bottom. And the other areas, these zones, they are a mixture of positive and number, negative numbers. All right, so where's the relevance in what we do? Well, we're going to look at, I'm going to talk about so one dimensional, two dimensional, and three dimensional entities, okay? and how they ultimately affect the formation of surfaces, solids, and the machine processes that we use to actually create those items for real, okay? So let's get rid of those. Don't need any of those. 
back, yeah, now keep the bodies on. Now, obviously I'm using fusion here, I'm going to explain what, is all, what this whole area is a little later. But firstly, I want to demonstrate what a one-dimensional entity is. And you might be thinking, well, what is that? What could that possibly be? It is just a point, okay? It has no movement, okay, relatively speaking. Yes, it's, I'm sitting in an office, I'm on a planet, we're moving. But generally, it's not moving. It's, it's regarded as stationary. It's one-dimensional. However, if I drew another point, and stuck a line between them to form a relationship, they instantly become connected, co-joined. They become two-dimensional. Okay, so there's two points, and there is that line that exists between them. That's representative, that line. That's known as a vector, okay? Now, in certain types of software, vectors and lines are separate things, but in terms of fusion and other software like it, they are regarded as the same. We treat them pretty much as the same, okay? The thing to understand about vectors or lines within the 3D or even 2D environment, ad environment, is that they have no thickness, okay? Yes, they have a direction, they have a magnitude in that direction, but they have no discernible thickness, okay? So they are infinitesimally thin, all right? And that is, a very important thing to bear in mind. Okay, big deal. So that is a two-dimensional entity, as is this. Now this is called a spline. We're gonna look at splines a little later. It still exists only in, well, it can exist in one plane. It can exist across planes. But the fact of the matter is, it is a curve that is joining up two points, makes it two-dimensional. Now, this is where it gets a bit fuzzy, for, particularly for people. So, for example, if I took that and gave it depth, it becomes three-dimensional. However, because it's got a profile that is this vector, this, this curve that has no thickness, that three-dimensional form is regarded as a surface and not a solid. All right, so I'll just extrude that up. Et voila. Okay. So we've got a three dimensional form made of a two dimensional vector. So this is a surface. And surfaces are interesting. We use surfaces for a number of things, but the things that we can't use surfaces for are for 3D printing. Okay. So I've got a shoe here, it was 3D printed. If this was made of surfaces, um, I could CNC machine it. But because of how 3D printing works, whereby you are adding material to something, you instantly start, um, uh, you instantly start to, to apply mechanical const um, constraints to it. So for example, you might have a layer height where material is added layer by layer. So thereby that's a distance, okay, that's a thickness. You also have like a nozzle diameter, depending on the type of printer. So this was printed using fused deposition modeling, FDM printing. Okay, and Ian's gonna be looking at that next week with uh, Cura, okay? But even if you use, say, um, selective laser sintering, probably can't see that, it's still made up of layers. And the laser beam that is used to make this, or partly make that, that has a diameter itself. So thereby it's very difficult to replicate these kind of things now, conse uh, now conversely we can see and see machine these things and it's a different process we are removing material okay so with 3d printing you are filling a volume um, with cnc machining you are removing material to expose the final model so here's an example sawdust all over my laptop so this is a CNC machined body of an angel. This is in pine, okay? But this started off as a block. And so what the machine or the software kind of interprets that the tool comes down into that virtual model or what it perceives and it treats surfaces like a barrier. 
and it just doesn't machine beyond that point. And so surfaces for machining are really handy. And the reason being is, is that with surfaces, you can actually get away with a lot. You can do some sloppy designing, so to speak, using surfaces in order to make life easier for yourself when it comes to fabricating. Now that's all well and good, but if you wanted to 3D print, which more often not people tend to, okay, you have to thereby give your virtual thing a thickness. Okay, now I've, I've showed you, um, I've, I've just like, um, I was uh, just like offering stuff up to the camera, but you probably can't see my camera, so I'll show those a little later. So in order to give this a thickness, you have to give it depth. And so in this case, I'll just give it a little bit of depth. Now that's no longer a surface, that is regarded as a solid, okay? It's a weird one for people to get their heads around because like, you know, I'm, I'm sitting at a desk, you can hear that, I'm banging against it, I'm banging against the surface. Yes, it is a surface, it's also a solid. Just to let you know, uh, Owen, we could see the objects. because You could see the objects? Yeah, well, I could. I'm hopefully, everybody else could as well. Well, that's really good. I don't know how, well, that's great. Oh, yeah, because I can see my screen. If I can see myself, I'm, yeah, right, good. Thank you, Ian, for that. Okay, so, as you can see, when, when we are designing for manufacturing, or fabrication at least, um, it's really important to understand that end process. And... It's, it's all very well having an initial idea and what you think is going to be um, the, the end result. But you've got to deal with the bit in the middle. And the bit in the middle is the designing, but also consideration like how you're going to fabricate it. Okay? Right. So that's the fundamental design environment considerations kind of covered. All right? So let's have a look at Fusion 360 itself. Now, hopefully, you've all got it open and running. Um, if you haven't, obviously, just boot it up. That'd be good. Okay, I'm just going to... Um, well, we'll look at this in a minute, actually, because the browser is uh, an interesting area that we need to look at. I'm just going to get rid of that. And uh, bear with me a moment. That's a good mouse. All right. Okay. So let's have a look. So this is Fusion. Um, if you want to create a new document in Fusion, there's two ways of doing it. Um, when you open it, it should be a blank document anyway, okay? But if you want to create a new document, there's a, up in the top left, there's a, a, an icon that says File. If I click on that, I can go New Design. You can go to Electronics Design. We're not covering Electronics in this. New Drawing. We'll We'll have a look at that maybe. But essentially you can click on that. Alternatively, there are these tabs right at the very top here. So I've got a tab there, a tab there, and there's a little plus sign. If I click on that, instantly I have a blank design. Okay. Okay, so the question is what is Fusion 360? Fusion 360 is um, a piece of software whereby you can create two-dimensional and three-dimensional entities and you can then save them as renders and if you don't know what a render is a render is when you take a virtual object and essentially you make it lifelike or you give it appearance to make it look like it's made of something in a setting somewhere okay but you can also output through Fusion 360 into maybe other software to do 3D printing or laser cutting or CNC machining. You can also output, it, uh, output um, the designs you make into two-dimensional drawings as well, okay? The bottom line is though, Fusion 360, how, how it's organized, you can see it as an analogy between say maybe um, a toolbox i tend to use the toolbox analogy whereby you've got a cabinet full of tools that cabinet is fusion each this within this cabinet there are drawers and each drawer is a selection of tools that do a group of maybe similar jobs to other drawers but they relate to different objects created okay 
And a lot of CAD software, if not software full stop, is like that. Okay. Now you could you could um, use the analogy that it's like being in a supermarket. Um, every tool can be found down a particular aisle on a particular space in the shelf. You could also see it like maybe transport systems, like if you're on a you're getting a train somewhere, you go in one stop, that gets you to an, one tool, or you go to another stop, it gets you to another or a process. But however you see it, that's how it's kind of laid out. It's very, very systematic. Okay. So what does Fusion 360 enable other than the ability to draw and create? Okay. Well, Fusion is cloud-based. All right. So it belongs in the ether somewhere. So anything you create on it is stored somewhere, somewhere else. You can work offline with it. You can also save any files that you create locally onto your laptop or a hard drive somewhere, okay? But what it means is, because it's, um, because it's cloud-based, it means that it's very powerful in terms of collaboration. So what that means is I can invite people into, say, doing certain things. So like this thing with the Cartesian axes, this file here, if I just turn some on, it might be the case that, oh, I know, I want to invite someone like Ian, for example, to collaborate on that. In which case, I'd actually find the project shared by me. Bear with me. I have a lot of projects on here, teaching resources, and that's handy. So I could click as to where it exists, and I could say, hmm, people. I want to invite people. As you can see, there's a lot of people involved in this, in this folder that we got for the Smart Citizens program. But I could invite anyone, and I do that by putting a, an email address in. But you can't just put any old email address in there. That email address has to have your copy of Fusion 360 tied to it, okay? And so what happens is, is that, for example, let me see now, Andy Pierce up in the corner who I can see, I could invite him if I had his email, no, hopefully knowing that that email will be connected to Fusion, and then he could contribute to the design on the page. You could even adjust it, edit that thing, okay? It's a really powerful way of disseminating information and sharing it. And the beauty of it is, is that, you know, you could be sitting next to me at the desk next to me. Alternatively, you could be on the other side of the world, in another continent, in another time zone. You can still work on the same projects live. Okay. Now, the other good thing about what it enables, it enables not just this, this ability to invite people, but it also enables the ability to upload files and programs from maybe other software like Inkscape, which Ian will be looking at in a couple of weeks, um, or from online from resources like Thingiverse, that um, is a free online resource of designs, all sorts of stuff. You might want to upload something into Fusion in order to modify it, okay? But also you can export. And export is very powerful. And this is something that we're going to do right at the right towards the end when you'll get a chance to create a three dimensional object. Whatever shape or size that may be, you're going to create something. Okay. Now, Fusion 360 um, is multimodal in, in its operation. So, for example, if you can see here, we I have a tab right on the left hand side where it's a box, it says design. I'm in this design window, and this is where I'm create, I've created this kind of 3D plane type thing going on. If I drop down that menu, we've got something else, generative design. And if you notice with Fusion, if you leave the mouse hovering over something, it gives you kind of like a little brief summary of what it does. So here it says, Generative design workspace creates multiple designs that meet your manufacturing performance and cost requirements. It's not the easiest thing to do. I would maybe veer away from it if you are absolutely new to Fusion, stick to design. But we also have things like render. And so, for example, this is where we can apply 
um, finishes to stuff. So these all, have all been rendered. I've applied a painted surface. If, if they had nothing on them, they would just be gray, okay? We'll look at rendering in a bit more depth. We've got animation. Not gonna look at animation, but here you can record how you move things apart. So you can record how things come together and interact. Um, and you can actually download that as a bit of footage. We also have simulation. Simulations are, are things for like stresses, strains, static loads, new studies. It is well beyond the scope of uh, this introduction, but naturally I've got to touch upon it and that's it. We also have manufacturing and manufacturing is whereby we can take, uh, so like milling, we can take an imaginary block of material. So for example, if I wanted to machine that, I could have this as an imaginary block of material with that design in it and it would work out the tool, tool profiles, what it's got to do to remove that material. I'm not gonna cover that either, that's as far as it goes. This is more advanced stuff for later sessions, uh, later courses. Um, and then finally, we got drawing. And this is where you can take your 3D design or even 2D design and place it within a drawing setting. So for example, I mean, probably not so common nowadays, but certainly back in the day, engineers would do drawings by hand. It's called drafting, okay? But you can draft your object in a form whereby you can give that paper form or even a digital form to someone and they could read it and interpret that and possibly make it, okay? Sometimes people need blueprint plans and this is how you would get it. Okay, so that's it. Now, what else does it enable? Fusion 360 is parametric, and that is really powerful, okay? So I'm gonna give an example of what it is to be parametric. So I'm just gonna draw, um, I'm gonna create um, something called a primitive. We'll look at these later. I'm gonna say it's a sphere. Yeah, there, oh, there it is. And I'll say it's, um, I don't know, 120, Oh, it's massive. I've made it 1.2 meters wide. It's probably too big. I can't even see it. It's too big. So I'll do that again. Just bear with me. Um, oh, there we go. So yeah, let's not create a massive sphere. Let's create it 200 millimeters. And there it is. Okay. So I might want to create um, another sphere. And I will create that there, maybe. There we go. And I'll say that's 50. Okay. We'll look at this later. So I've created that sphere there and that sphere there. Now, the parametric function means that I can go back in time and change something in the history of that design, and it will have a ripple effect all the way along that design timeline and change something in the present. So for example, if I go, and it's right at the very bottom of the screen, okay, there's a slider there, I can go there and move that, oh, there we go, that's disappeared. But if I click on that and edit that, I could change the diameter of that, I could say, well, actually, I want that a bit maybe smaller, okay? And if I move that timeline at the bottom of the screen again, it's affected it, that actual little divot there is bigger than what it was. Or I could change that edit feature, I could make that larger and make that crater even bigger. This is really, really powerful, powerful stuff because at the end of the day, I mean, there's two main bits of 3D software we use. One is Rhino, this is Fusion. If say I was designing something to slot together like a bit of furniture and it's dependent on a particular thickness of material, but I can't get that material, I can get it, I can only get a material that's got a different thickness, well, in something like Rhino, I'd have to change every slot manually. In Fusion 360, I, can I could um, constrain all those slot sizes to be the same. I only have to change one, and it changes all of them. Saves a lot of time, a lot of effort, okay? Okay, so now it's down to the nuts and bolts of um, Fusion. Now, with your design in Fusion, we, I hope you've got your window uh, Fusion loaded. 
going to get rid of that. Um, we have working parameters that we use in the Fab Lab. And we want them to be the same. We want what you're using to be the same as what we're using. And the only reason why is that there is consistency in what we're delivering. And it kind of minimizes the amount of confusion that can arise. And so what I need you all to do using your mouse, okay? And I haven't even looked at the mouse yet. I suppose I should look at that first really, but. What I want you to do is draw the mouse over to the top right corner and there's usually a little circle there. It might have your initials in it. It might have a picture in it in this case. And so I put my mouse over that and it says my name, Owen Groombridge. Okay. If I right click on the mouse, it opens up a menu. Okay. So there we go. And what I'm looking for are preferences. So I've opened that window, I've gone right over to that icon, I've let, right clicked onto it, gone to preferences, and I'm gonna left click to open that to select it. And where is it? There it is. So hopefully you've all got this preference box that's appeared. And it's preferences controlling general UI behavior, and UI is user interface. Now the thing, the important thing that needs to be the same for myself, for Ian, for all my colleagues here, and for you guys, is that the default modeling orientation. And that is like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it's the seventh row down. And mine says Z up. You have a choice of Y up or Z up. I want you to choose Z up, okay? Now, also, we have something called another six rows down. We have a pan, a zoom, orbit shortcuts. And this one, you have a selection of Fusion, Alias, Inventor, SolidWorks, Tinkercad. We use SolidWorks. And the reason why we use SolidWorks is because that means that our mouse functions the same, has the same functionality as it does if we're using SolidWorks or Rhino or pro engineer, other bits of software that exist. Okay, and it's for us, it's familiarity. And that's it really, all the other boxes, well, I mean, it helps if you show your tool tips, show command prompts, show default measures, show in command errors and warnings. They're very handy because they tell you when things are going wrong. Show fusion team notifications, yeah. So if I change something, or for example, Andy Pierce there in the corner of my screen, if, um, sorry, Andy, I probably shouldn't mention your name, you know, but um, if he changes something within the corner, uh, within a design, it tells me. And I go, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, so there's uh, been an iteration change. Brilliant. All right. Once you've done that, just go okay, or apply it and then okay. Okay. So. So that's the uh, axes and mouse setup of Fusion, okay? Now the question is, how does the mouse work? Now I know at least one of you is actually using a, um, you're using a, uh, a Wacom tablet and a stylus. Um, the functionality is slightly different, but with the mouse, I've got a mouse here, it's got three buttons and a roller. The roller is also a button, you see? So I've got the left button here, the right button, and the middle button, which is a roller, and that was that's the zoom button in my case. All right. Now it's important to um, understand that the left button is for basically selecting. So you select tools. You select where you place that tool. You select when, oh, and you can use it for. Well, that's it. You select tools. You select things with it. The right button is mainly menus. So if you hit the right button, a menu will open. So if I hit a right button there on the screen opens a menu. And then I can select with, don't even try it, Owen. I could select like, for example, sketch. Well, I haven't got any sketches, so, but you see what I mean? You can select items, all right? Now the Fusion 360 layer, I hope that's kind of clear about how the mouse works. It does take a little bit of getting used to, okay? It certainly does. 
Um, and my colleagues and I, we don't actually expect any of you guys to remember any of this. I, I say, always say that to students when I give inductions and things like that, and it's perfectly acceptable. And that's why it's being recorded, all right? So you can refer back. Okay, now the Fusion 360 layout basically works from left to right. So at the top left, not at the very top, well, near enough, there are nine grayed out squares. And if I click on that, if I left click on that, whoop, it brings me to this, or it, there's a house button there. Yep, so there's a house button there, and this shows me where my files are, a lot of my files. And it shows me what has been shared with me, so the kind of things that I'm a collaborator on, uh, things that I've pinned, which isn't many, stuff that is owned by me so okay so i've got a whole list of people's names but what it means when it's owned by you is that it means that you are the uh, moderator you would send out invites to people to then contribute all right lots of stuff there but also shared with me so as i said that's the stuff that i've been invited to or all projects Fusion is a bit problematic when it comes to filing. I find it really difficult to move one thing from one folder to another. I find it really tough. So, you know, maybe give it some thought. If you're going to have like a series of projects that involve making stuff for your household, like I do, I have a folder for that. And in there, I have all those items that I've made for my household, for example, and so on and so forth. All right. Now you can close that window at time. There's, an, there's a button that's X, it just closes it. Because if you've got a small screen, I've got this on a whacking great screen at the moment, but if you have a small screen like a laptop or whatever, you want to utilize as much of that design space as possible. Okay, so moving leftwards, here under design, where you've got all those different work things, the, those different modes of operation, I've got something called the browser. Now the browser might be hidden away. Next to the word browser is two arrows. If I click on that, it hides it. I don't want to hide it generally because the browser is all important, okay? The browser is super important. The browser gives you structure because Fusion works with a high degree of structure. It's not like the likes of Rhino where it's not like that at all. It doesn't have a browser. It doesn't even have parametric um, commands. But the browser, I'll use um, the Cartesian axis plane thing. The browser is a way of organizing the things that you create. How you label stuff is up to you. But from the very get go, I would say label stuff meticulously if you can. I'm really quite anally retentive. I'm really quite crass when it comes to it. And the reason being is, is that you can create hundreds of different items within fusion and if one if they're called like sketch one sketch two sketch three it's easy to confuse which one is actually what the one you're looking for by labeling stuff you can see where it exists now the four, more things you create within fusion 360 the more that browser will get populated by different things okay so with that blank document i've got all it's got is origin. It hasn't got bodies or sketches because I haven't created any yet. Okay. Now the thing to notice is that we have document settings. So if I drop down menu, units, millimeters. I can change that if I want. There's a little icon there. Unit types, millimeters, centimeters, meters, inches, foot. We work in millimeters. It's up to you what you want to work in. If you work in like costume or something like that, or fabric patterns, you might actually work in yards, um, feet and inches. If you work in old architectural buildings, like very old theaters and you're into set design, you might have to work to feet, yards, feet and inches again. But generally we work in millimeters, okay? The SI unit, okay? So that's where you would set that. Under that, you've got named views. Named views are important, my mouse will work. And again, so it's like those plane views. Well, they've got names. They're not, they're, they're not necessarily called the XY plane or the XZ plane. The XZ plane top. 
that's the top plane, the front and the right and the home. And what there is, you can't see necessarily what's going on there, but so for example, I went into this axis scene. If I go to name views and I say, well, I want to look at it from the top, I click on that, puts me into the top viewpoint. I want to look at it at the front or the right, puts me into the right viewpoint. And home, yeah, well, that puts me into some kind of perspective viewpoint, right? And finally, to begin with, we've got things like origin. Now, next to the word origin, there's a little icon that looks like an eye. And that means you can hide things. Okay, I'll open that up and we've got these different things here. And it means that, all right, oh, ugh, it's freaky. No, he doesn't like it, what? Hmm. What it means is, is that you can hide. Ah, oh, yeah, my fusion's gone a bit skew with. But anyway, it means that you can hide certain things, yeah, certain viewpoints, or you can see them. And the reason why you want to hide stuff is because, for example, when you've got things like this Cartesian axis thing going on, I've got quite a few bodies there. If I turn them all on, it gets, it can get really confusing. And actually it's really detrimental to when you're designing. So it's, it's really handy to know if you've got things turned on and off. It's really easy to forget. I had to ask my colleague earlier on, I had to, you know, what am I doing wrong? I couldn't transfer text into a form that I could use properly. And he just said, yeah, you have it, you've got it turned off in your browser. So it even happens to us, right? All right, so moving on from the browser, the all-important browser. So we've got different um, tools here. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ignore that for the time being. I've talked about the parametric timeline at the bottom. There's nothing there. Right down the other end, right down the other end, yeah, let's create a new document because that one's bugged out. Don't save, okay. The darling. All right, so right down the other end, we've got on the right hand side, we've got something called the view cube. And the view cube is important because like named views, you could click on like that task, that, that view there, I could click on that. That puts me into the right hand view. There's a little arrow there, I wanna see the top. So there we go. And it shows me the top view, but it's not square on, it's rotated. So I could use that arrow and rotate it around. View cube is really good. And it's got a little house button there. You're going to come across the view cube in a, like, in a couple of weeks when, or maybe next week when you're using Slicer with Ian because it has the same thing. I could also hold the view cube with the left mouse button and I can rotate it manually like that. Now, when you're using a view cube, the thing to understand is that you are not rotating the object that you're looking at. You're just changing your point of view on it. The object stays virtually stationary and you're just changing your view. You're dollying a camera around it to see what's going on, all right? Okay, so now we've got a selection of tools here. At the, not, not at the very top, we've got things like solid and those tools are things that you create, will create solids and We'll look at that later on. We also have surface. Might look at that later on. It's not so important um, because we want to create stuff like we want to create an STL file that can then potentially be 3D printed, okay? And you can't 3D print surfaces. We'll look at surfaces when it comes to CNC machining in session six. You've got sheet metal, which is really handy because basically you can flat pack something like, you know, like a box, you have got boxes to hand, but you can flat pack a box and it also gives you a seam allowance as well. And then you've got tools and tools are like utilities, like 3D printing, nesting. Nesting is where you arrange different designs so it fits on a piece of material in the most efficient, hopefully, way. Okay. Now the tool that isn't there, there's two toolbars that are, that are not there at the moment. One is Sketch. And the other one is um, form. And there's a reason for that, okay? Sketch appears at a later date. And that's it there. Form appears if you hit this button here, create form. But we'll look at those um, 
in a little bit in a moment. Okay, so what we're going to do now, we're going to create a sketch. Okay, there are two ways. There, there are ways of act, um, activating this. So you have to activate this toolbar. Okay, but the easiest way is up on the top left, next to where it says Design. There's this box here. It's got a little green cross in the corner, in the bottom uh, right corner. And what I want you to do is hit that button there. Um, just so you know, you might notice that I don't have a grid on my screen. I just find it gets in the way generally. You can turn it on and off, but don't worry about that for the time being. You can do all that down the bottom of the screen here, right, right at the very bottom in the middle. So I'm going to create a sketch. Instantly, it's showing me those three planes, those three planes and those axes. So you've got to decide where you want to create a sketch. So just for intents and purposes, I'm going to create, I'm going to use the top. Now, to do this, if you hold your mouse, if you move your mouse without touching anything, like just move the cursor over those different planes, they shade out to show that that's the one you would select. So that's the top one. I'm happy with that. And I'm going to hit the left mouse button. Instantly, it puts me into that top view. So I'm looking at it flat on, square on. Okay. In the very middle of the screen is the datum point. Okay. So have we all got that? Has everyone got that sketch view? I'll give you a moment, Paul. Now, we haven't drawn anything and we're gonna draw something. But once you're finished with the design that you've got, the drawing, and it could be anything, believe me, there's on the, le on the right hand side, there's something called finish sketch. You have to finish a sketch to get out of this toolbox. And often, um, and sometimes it even happens with myself, often I'll be like, oh yeah, it's wrong. Well, Fusion's, not, Fusion's not responding to anything. I can't do anything. I'm still in sketch mode and I haven't realized it. I haven't looked on the toolbar, but it's usually the very first thing that can be a problem, right? Great. So, again, working from left to right, we've got create, we've got modify, constraints, inspect, insert, and select. The things that we're interested in today is create and modify. We will look at inspect later on. We're not gonna necessarily worry too much about constraints. It does muddy the water, but they are really, really handy. So what I want you to do, um, before you do anything else, before we draw anything, is um, draw your attention to this little tab sticking out of the right hand side. Mine's folded up. It's called the sketch palette. It only exists within sketch mode. Yeah, cool. So as Ian says, constraints will be covered in um, session three. Brilliant. Thanks, Ian. So I'm going to open that up. And that's called the sketch palette. I've got the sketch grid, I can turn it on and off. I can snap to that grid if I wanted to. I can slice stuff. Or more to the point, you can see this stuff. It doesn't mean that it'll actually do it for you. But this means that things are visible. We'll have a look at that in a minute. But first we'll go to create. Now, I've got a toolbar at the top of this tab create. And I've got tools there that you probably don't have. Okay, so I've got two types of rectangle, I've got a line, I've got a circle, I've got a mirror, I've got a point, I've got sketch dimension, and I've got control point spline. And the reason why I've got them there is because they are the tools that I tend to use most of. That's it, yeah? Now, how you customise this, I'll show you. Now, where it says create, there's a little arrow, and it's a drop-down menu, and that opens up into that toolbox, so that drawer full of drawing tools, yeah? Line is, um, it's there. So if I say hover over line, there are three dots right to the right, right to the right. There are three dots to the right. If I left click on that, it says pin to uh, toolbar, pin to shortcuts. Well, you can use keyboard shortcuts. I tend not to use them actually, but they make things very quick. But I've got pin to toolbar and that's why it's on the toolbar. If I just turn that off, boom, it's gone. 
I'm going to turn it back on because I use it a lot. So that's how you turn on tools to have up the top there. But as you can see, within this drop down menu, you've got things like rectangle, there's three types of rectangle circle, arc, polygon, uh, ellipse, slots, splines, we'll have a look at splines because they're interesting, conic curves, point, and text. For me, point is probably the most useful tool, but that's because I use it as references in designing stuff. I want you just to select a tool that draws either a line or a rectangle or a circle and arc. It, the choice is yours. I'm going to go for a spline and I'm going to go for a fit point spline. Even though there's no points on the screen, I'm going to use it. So to select a tool, it's the left click of the mouse. And there it is. So I've got I've got a pointer there, I've got crosshairs, my mouse turned into crosshairs, and it's got a tiny symbol next to it. If you've got a small screen, that's really tiny. Now, to place that, you need to set an anchor point. And that's, it's all about the left mouse button. So I'm just going to place mine anywhere within that grid. Yeah, anywhere, 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 anywhere. Anchor, left, 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 left. And there's a little tick button there. I could use that, and that, that, that finishes the use of the tool. Or I could just press escape which gets rid of it. So I won't press escape because that was the wrong thing to do. Take all of that back. Hopefully that will be edited out of the video. So anchor, 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 anchor. Okay, and now I've got a spline. The tool is still active and I can tell it's still active because my cursor is a crosshairs with that little symbol. To deactivate that tool, this is where you use escape, like that. So now I've just got that cursor. Now with this spline tool, I can change it around, like so. I can grab on those points and these paddles, I can change that spline. It's really, really nice, okay? Now, if I wanna do something like a square or a circle, I can select different ways of creating circles. So center circle down to two point, there's a two point circle, point there, point there, boom, circle created. Easy. Get rid of that. And that. Ooh. I'm going to create a circle from the center outward. So our center point, I'll, I'll left click to anchor that, that center. And I'm just dragging the mouse out. Now, as you notice, there's a little box there. It's in blue. And what that means is that I can type in a number. So in this case, I'm just going to type in 120. Voila, and I've created a circle that is 120 millimeters in diameter. The thing is, though, sometimes you might create a circle or, or something that doesn't have any size to it. So, for example, it doesn't appear to have a size to it. So if I just did that, so I've done that, and I'll just press enter. It's not really what I want. Uh, this, okay, I see I have a way of doing it. And I see other people where they go, oh, okay, so there you go. So I've just pressed the left mouse button to enter it. So I've got a circle, but we don't know how big that is. That's a problem, potentially. Up on the tool or the create toolbar, there's something here and it's called sketch dimension. If it's not there on your top of your toolbar, it will be under create, but it's near the bottom. Sketch dimension. So if I use that, the icons change, it's an arrow, I can just literally put that mouse, that cursor point on that circumferential edge and left click and then suddenly I've got a dimension there and then I can click it and then I can enter a dimension. All right, it's really important. It's a great, it's, it's a really important tool. It does save a lot of hassle. Again, I know it's there because I've used it thousands of times. If this is the first time you've ever used it, don't worry if you don't remember, right? Because you just look back at this recording and cut through the waffle to get to that point, all right? Okay, so I've got a circle there. What if I want to create another drawing on top of that? So I'm going to create a square and I'll have that there. And this is a center point, again, measured from the center. Again, like if I just left click, I have no dimensions on it. I have constraints, I'll turn all those off so we can't see them. 
Yeah. But I would go to sketch dimension again, and I would, I don't know, give it, give it some dimensions. There's 80, maybe I'll stick one in there, 60. Right. Okay. Now, once you've finished with whatever sketch you've done, and feel free to play around with it to your heart's content, you then go to finish sketch. All right. And then the browser sketch has appeared under a folder. And in there, if I open that up, it's called sketch one. If I just left click on that once and highlight that in blue, it highlights the sketch in blue. All right. Cool. Well, that's great, you know, but oh, I've hidden it. But what if I want to go back and modify that sketch? I'm not in sketch mode anymore. Well, you go to that sketch and you could do one of two things. It's a double left click and it, it should open it back up in sketch mode. But if it doesn't, if it doesn't do that, you just right click and you have a drop down menu and it says edit sketch. Okay, so you should be back in edit sketch mode, sketch edit mode, hopefully, because we're going to do some modifications. And here in the modification box, it's not as big as a toolbar. You can do things like chamfer. Well, you can't really put a chamfer on anything here. Maybe the square. You can trim stuff. So if I select trim, I'm going to trim that away and that away and these bits away. So where, the, where those vectors, those lines intersect, I've trimmed them away. Now, it looks like there's lines there, but that's not. That's just dimensional information. You can just grab that with the mouse and drag them out of the way if you want, because they do get in the way. Okay. And sure enough, oh, yeah, that's the dimension there. Oh, no, I could trim that too. There we go. Now, you might notice that I've got a stippled brown line there. That's called a construction line. Construction lines give you lines of reference. I tend to term them as something like a scaffold. Yeah, so scaffolding. And what that means is, is that I can then apply lines to it, these polylines, these solid lines. The thing to note about construction um, lines, these stippled lines, is that you can't do three-dimensional, you can't create three-dimensional objects with them. Now, in order to change them into something usable, you select it with the mouse. So the, the mouse has got to be just like the arrow tool, the pointer. I select that. And over in the sketch palette, it says line type. Construction, it's highlighted in blue. It's telling me it's a construction line. If I unclick that, I've instantly turned that into a polyline, something called a polyline. And we could use that to create a surface or a shape, all right? Don't worry about that too much. But if you're ever wondering why you've created something and it's not extruding or revolving or whatever, and we'll look at those in a minute, well, after the break, it is because it will probably be a construction line. Okay? Right. So what else can we do? We've got things called offset. An offset is where you select your, your curve, and um, in, in 2D and 3D design, a curve can be a straight line. Sounds a bit counterintuitive. You think it'd have a radius, but it's regarded as a straight line as well, curves. And this way, I've got a little paddle here. It says I've selected that. And actually, this is a really good time to draw your attention to a little dialog box that all, not always, but generally opens up when you're using tools, particularly modifying tools in sketch mode. So here it is. And in there, it says select curves, I've done that. If I want to deselect it, there's a little X there, I'll just get rid of it. And then I select what I want to use. Now, because it's a closed loop, it will select them all. It chains them together. I suppose if I unchain them, you can see it says selected curves, there's five of them. If I chain them together, it says it's one. And that's handy because actually, if, if I can just individually select like lines, like so. So, you, well, obviously not that one, because oh yeah, because I need to select it in, as a chain in order. There we go. So I can select all of those bar the one you can't see at the bottom. But if I turn that on, oh, it selects that too. Oh, it doesn't like that. 
mind. But offset's really, really handy. Use it a lot. It's not minus. Now the thing is with tools like offset, it might want you to put a minus, uh, a positive or a negative number in there. It's a bit weird like that, but that's how it works. You just got to make a note which what kind of which way is it going. I, I don't know what the hard and fast rule. Well, I don't know what the actual rule it is in Fusion why it does that, but. I just see which direction it, it wants me. So inside is a positive number, outside is a negative number. It seems counterintuitive really, but there you go. All right, so I'm just gonna say minus five. Okay. Now, uh, you might discover that if you wanna do offset again, you cannot offset a line that has been created by an offset. Curiously enough, you have to go back to that original line that you offset in the first place. All right. Okay. So that's all well and good. I've created a, I've created a, an item there. If we want to create multiples of that item, though, we use the pattern tool. Now, when you're doing things like patterns, that is found within the create section because you are creating a new thing. But there's a real word of warning, and I can't emphasise this enough that fusion as powerful it is and it is really powerful when it comes to the 3d design element when it comes to 2d design it can be a bit funky i don't know why that is it doesn't really make sense i mean it's one of those things it's one of those um foibles that it has and what you're going to be aware of is that when you create patterns if you've got something complicated and you think i'll tell you what i'm going to have a circular pattern there and um, it'll say object select, all right, I'm gonna select all of those. And the center point, well, I need to draw a point really, but the only point I've got is in the middle, I'm gonna select that, that'll do. Or even the, I'll select a corner point. Again, dialog box, this is just a little uh, sidetrack here. Um, when it's highlighted in blue, it's asking, it's, it's asking you to select that thing, all right? So if I select, hold click that in blue, yeah, it's 24 items, that's good. Yeah, if I select that, it wants a point. I'm going to select that point there. Yeah, and then suppress. I'll unclick that. That means it's going to withhold. And go. All right, it doesn't like it, does it? Oh, no, because I haven't selected anything. No, it doesn't like that. How about... Oh, man. All right, so I'm going to draw a point and digress. As you can see... Um, Yes, I do use the, that tool, but I don't use it too often because of because it's really heavy on the processor. And you might find that it locks up your laptop. That is not cool. You could be there for a while while it's trying to work it, whatever it is it's trying to work out. So be warned. You are better off making patterns out of solids or surfaces than trying to do it with sketches. In fact, you might be better doing pattern like exporting that as something called a DXF file into Inkscape and pat doing a pattern in there. All right, cool. 24 objects. Where's my point? There's my point. There we go. That was annoying. Okay, now I could increase that number like so. Yeah, see that's slowing down already. Oh, doesn't like it. Yeah, you can create some interesting stuff. It just doesn't like it. So please be aware of that. I don't want you like just crashing your computer because sometimes you just literally have to turn your machine off. It's not cool. Um, I don't know why. It must be to do with the architecture of the software. Right, I'm going to change that. Now suppression, if I click that, I can turn off individually certain ones that I don't want. I'll turn these off at a random fashion. As you can see, they're disappearing. All right. It's a really handy feature. So they don't have to, oh, don't do that. that. Don't do that either. Don't do that. Do that. They don't have to be all on. All right. I'll just go OK. Right. So, some patterns, you can mirror stuff. The mirroring is using this, but it needs a plane. So, for example, 
I'll use mirror, it says objects. All right, I'm going to select all of them because I'm, I'm crazy. It says mirror line. Well, where is the mirror line? You can't really see it. That's because I've, I've got all of my objects turned off, my origin. So if I turn them on, I know there's a mirror line there, but an easier way to see it is in perspective. So if I go back to the view cube where that house button is, oh, there it is, there's the mirror line. I'm gonna use that one. Bang, there it goes, it's over there. And then I can go, okay. And sure enough, I've replicated all of those. Yeah, it, it didn't like that. It took a little bit of while to process all of that. Right, okay, so. Now the thing is, I've created a sketch, I'll go to finish sketch. I want to give it a name. In order to give it a name, I'll go over to the browser. Under, you can't change the name of the folder, it's called sketches. I'm just going to go to sketch, I'm going to hold down on it with the left mouse button, let go. And there it is, it kind of highlights in a flashing blue and I'll just call it um, pattern. Call it whatever you want, whatever you've done. But in terms of bigger drawings, bigger designs, you might want to be as organized as you possibly can. It is tempting just to go, oh, I don't need to do that. And yeah, I do it myself if it's a very quick design that I'm never going to reference again. It's just, you know, that's fine. But if it's something that is, say, maybe a bit of research you're doing, like some research I'm doing, I have to document everything, including all the names. So that, that pays. Okay, so right, we're going to take a 10 minute break now. If that's right, obviously go and have a cup of tea, go and stretch your legs. Alternatively, go and have a play around with the um, sketch function. Welcome back. Welcome back. So, what we're going to cover in this uh, this half, we're going to cover solid tools, and we're going to cover form, parametric change. I mean, we've looked at that, but I want you to have a go on it. Um, inspection, render and exporting 2D and 3D files. Um, that's it, he says, <laughs> that's a lot. So what we're gonna do, what I'd like you to do, I want you to create a new document within Fusion 360. And uh, if you're not sure how to do that, just wait a second or I'll give you like 10 seconds or so and I will do it, I'll demonstrate with my mouse. So create a document, a new document in Fusion 360. Okay, well, I'm just gonna do it. Mine's called Untitled. I'm gonna get rid of that, I don't want that. I'm gonna save. I'm gonna have a look at that. Oh, there's a shoe there, I wonder what that's all about. Okay, so, now solid tools. Um, Solid tools generally are permanently selected as a toolbox in, in Fusion when it's in design mode, okay? So in design, there's design, yeah, we've got solid. It's um, underlined and highlighted in blue. That means it's active and it's got these tools, okay? We, we can create a sketch from there. It's got revolve. Um, revolve is when you take an object that is um, like a profile and a shape and you you take that object and you spin it around a central axis and things like um, things like I don't have on me so if you can imagine my mug here it has this profile with it like that and there and there's a wall thickness that you can't see if you imagine it was just that was just a line drawn in fusion and you've got an imaginary central axis. If I select that profile as the thing we want to revolve, and then we select that, select that central axis, cool. And you select that central axis to rotate around. You could rotate that entirely around it. We'll have a look at that in a minute. Okay, the next one we've got is extrude. So that's revolve, nice picture of revolve there. Then we've got extrude and extrusions. Um, I often ask people, it's, it's easier when, um, it's actually easier to ask people when there are people actually physically present. What's an extrusion? Give us an example. Well, examples of extrusions in, in day to day, so-called day to day life, um, as Ian will know about this because he owns a lot of them, pasta making machines. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah, you got them in your kitchen. I know you have. So a pasta machine, all right? So you put pasta dough in this machine, you crank a handle, it winds it out, and it could wind it out, wind it out as a flat sheet, or you have a press and it pushes it through something called a die. That die is a profile, it's a shape, okay? And that shape could any, be anything. It could be circular, it could be square, it could be a polygon, it could be, well, whatever mess um, I make. And you give that a three-dimensional form. It comes out right at you. It's called an extrusion. And this is an example of an extrusion. This is a piece of aluminium. It is called aluminium extrusion. So this would have been forced through a die, a shape that is that shape, like this cross, this X. And then it forms that. Really good. That's called an extrusion. That's a real-world thing. But put that back on the boss's desk. He'll want that. Um, another example of extrusive processes, Play-Doh. I like using the idea of play I haven't used Play-Doh since I was a kid, but the idea of sticking some kind of doughy substance into a press that then you squash and it comes out as crazy hair or whatever. That is extrusion. All right? We're going to really be looking at extrusion, okay? Now, other things we've got, yes, like Sketch, we've got Mirror, so we can emulate... Uh, we can copy one object item from one side of a plane to another. We've got threads. I'm not going to worry about threads at the moment. We've got form. That create form exists within solid. It's an interesting one, but we're going to look at that too in a separate section. We've also got a, a various amount of modify tools. Push pull. What the hell is that? Fill it. Fillets are really quite important. That's when you give something a rounded edge, particularly on an internal curve. Um, it actually makes structures fairly strong if you're 3D printing stuff uh, or machining. Shell, combined. Combine is really good where you can take two items, join them together. Um, you can make new components. I won't, I won't go into that in too much depth on uh, And split bodies. Yes, you've got things like assembly. We're not going to look at that. We have things like construct. We might look at that and inspect. We will look at that. Okay, so there are two ways, two main ways of creating a solid body. Firstly, um, you've got primitives. You've got something called a primitive. And it's like, well, what the hell is a primitive? A primitive is an object that you basically select from the drop down toolbar. So I've got create here in the solid um, toolbox, tool drawer. And the primitives, it doesn't call, it doesn't say they're primitives, but that's what we know them as. They're kind of halfway down the screen. So we've got box, cylinder, sphere, torus, otherwise known as a donut, coil, and pipe. They are primitives. So, for example, um, I'm going to use box. Okay, I've selected box. Now, like anything, though, you, you, you create with infusion. It wants you to select a plane. That is your plane of reference to refer it to, to draw it from. Okay, no matter what it is you're doing, you will always be expected to ask for a plane. Unless you're rendering, it's different. Okay, so I'm going to select the top plane. Now, notice it hasn't changed into like that top viewpoint. And the reason being is we're creating a three-dimensional object. If it were to be, say, created in this top viewpoint, well, I mean, what are you going to see? Uh, okay, so I'm drawing the profile of a square or a rectangle. I'm going to do a rectangle because I like cuboids. And it's like, oh, uh, well, now what? You can't see it. So that's why the viewpoint is in perspective because now I can drag that up to give it thickness, to give it body, I suppose. Uh, rudimentary amount, that sounds good. And so I've made myself a cuboid, and if you don't know what a cuboid is, it is a three-dimensional rectangle. Um, okay, there we go. I've, I've made a brick, kind of. That's a primitive. Now, obviously, there are other ways of making primitives. Tauruses. Uh, if I say select a, mm, it's a bit odd there, I'm going to 
change the viewpoint. I want to put my central point there. I want to draw that like so. Oh, easy. And then I'm going to give it a thickness. Yeah, like that to make it a nice donut shape. Okay. Now, the reason why we have these tools is because, um, not really for me, I don't tend to use them, but it's, you know, often in design, you need something that is a stock thing. These are a stock thing, and you would then change the dimensions to suit whatever you want. Okay? Brilliant. However, there are other ways of creating said cuboid and said torus. All right? You cannot create a torus by, by conventional one directional extrusion. You can create a torus by, it's not, really, it's not regarded as extrusion, but extrusion through rotation. That's called a revolve. Now, how we do that, other than creating primitives and changing them, is through something called sketching. And we looked at sketching just before the break. All right, so I'm gonna get rid of, I'm gonna hide these, these things that I've created. Hide those. And as you might have noticed that as soon as we created uh, these, um, these items, bodies, the folder bodies appeared in the browser on the left. I could name them, but um, I suppose I should, because it's good practice. Uh, cuboid and porous. I could actually just call it a toroid to be really particular. All right, so now you may or may not remember, but how we create a sketch is that well, there's the sketch button. As I said, there are other ways of creating or of activating sketches. Um, I could go to origin open up and say, oh, hello, I want to create something on that, uh, that top plane, the XY plane, okay? I would right click on that and I'll go create sketch. And voila, and it selects that plane. It takes the guesswork out, because if I did it the, the way I showed you originally, you then have to physically select that plane with your mouse, all right? Anyway, I digress. So, I'm gonna draw a rectangle, like so and how you draw that rectangle um it could be from corner to corner it could be from center if you haven't got those toolbars up on uh, up on the top there remember they are found under the create tab so maybe i shouldn't be so lazy and just show you from the create tab where they actually are so there's rectangle and i could go for three point rectangle to be really quite funky so in which case i'll do that i'm going to put that up the first point on the dating point. You can put it wherever you want, by the way. I'm going to put a second point at an angle to that. And uh, there we go. So I've got a rectangle that's on an angle because of the way it's, it's drawn. It's that kind of rectangle. Okay. It's got no dimensions on it. So I'm going to give it some sketch dimensions. Like so. And I'm going to call that, oh, I'm going to call that 120. And that one there, I'm going to call... 80, something, something, something almost Fibonacci about that. Okay, I should give it 100, anyway, whatever. Okay, so I've got a rectangle there. And the reason why the, the sides uh, change at the same time is because of constraints, and Ian will cover that in session three. All right, so I've got that rectangle. I'm finished with the sketch, I'm done. So I'm gonna go finish sketch. It hasn't changed its viewpoint. All right, so I'm going to change that by pressing that little house button by the view cube on the left, on the right hand side. And the reason being is I'm doing, I'm, I'm going to do that is because again I'm extruding, so I want to see where it's going. Now, when we left sketch mode, it automatically went back to solid. Yeah, so let's get out of it. it automatically went back to there, solid, underlined, highlighted in blue. In sketch mode, if I didn't point it out already, and uh, I'll point it out again, because why not? When I do that, the word sketch appears at the top, highlighted blue and underlined in blue, all right? It shows it's active. 
why it disappears, I suppose it disappears when it's not in use because you can only, you know, what, what point is there having that there? You need to activate it, it needs to be active. Okay, so we're in solid mode. We've got create and I'm gonna find extrude, there it is. Now, if I just, you know, that doesn't have to be selected. If you've got more than one sketch um, present, it might ask you to select which one. In fact, you could select any number of sketches, but this is already selected and it's got an arrow. And with the left hand button on the mouse, if I just hold that down, I could drag that around and there you go, I'm creating a, a, a virtual solid form. All right. But also, you've got the toolbox where well, you've got this, you've got the, um, you've got this, uh, little box here that's got your preferences in there as in what do you want to do with it okay um so you've got a thin extrude you've got just a general extrude which i showed you you've got a thin extrude let's grab that and what that does is it creates a thin wall okay and that wall thickness is is down here everything you need to know is here everything you need to input is there Okay, so I can say, well, actually, I want to have that as five mil thick. And there you go, changes it. I mean, Fusion Blink, it's really great for this. Like other software, it's like painfully slow, you know. You have to draw multiple sketches or whatever, and then extrude them at different times and then remove material. Not in Fusion, no. I'm gonna do it as a plain extrude though, okay? Now, we've got Start, which is the profile plane. Yeah, that's usually okay. You can offset it if you want, um, like so. I'll grab that, I could say, or oh, maybe I want to offset 120. And so I did. I didn't mean to do that, actually. You know, let's go back there. I didn't mean to press enter. But when you press enter, it finalizes that, that um, process. I'm not finished yet. So if I drag that up, got profile plane, and you've got direction. You've got three choices, and this is usually typically true of creating solids, of creating surfaces, creating forms. Okay, this is a typically true thing. And in there, you've got one direction, which is set as default. You've got two sided. And what that means is that if you've got something that is sitting on a, a, a plane, so like the top plane, and you're extruding upwards, I could extrude some of it downwards by a given amount, a, a separate amount, like so. So it's, it's like 120 mil up, 20 mil down. Alternatively, I could extrude that in the same direction. And something curious happens. As you can see, that material that I'm extruding up into disappears. And that's really handy, because sometimes you, want, you don't necessarily want to draw um, you don't necessarily want a construction plane because, or in another drawing, you could just extrude it in mid, in, fit, in mid air. So very handy, All right? Now you've got distance here, two objects. So if I had another object there, I could extrude it to that object by selecting it and it would go straight there automatically, okay? We can also give things angles, taper angles. If I say, oh, I want to give that an angle of like 10 degrees. Oh yeah, it's extruded it outwards 10 degrees. But what about the bottom? How about that one? Maybe I want to give that like minus 10 degrees. Well, maybe it doesn't want me to do that. Oh yeah, it's because I removed the material, haven't I? There we go. There's that 10 degree angle. Maybe I would like, want to change that to like maybe five or minus five okay really quite versatile this all right so that's basically extrusion however it's not over there it's not over because in this dialog box where you've got all these different settings at the bottom, separated by a line, is something called operation. And you need to take note of what operation is, what it does. Operation is important, and it's something that you will see in a lot of ways of creating three-dimensional forms. 
So drop down menu, yes, I'm gonna create a new body. And the reason being is, is that, well, there's no other bodies, we're gonna create a few more. Or maybe there is, so, but I can join it. So this I'll show you in a minute, we'll, we'll run through that together. You've got join, you've got cut, you have intersect. New body, which is basically set, it's not set by default, actually. Um, Fusion 360 has some kind of AI built into it, so it kind of thinks maybe you want to remove the two or join the two. So that's why you always have to pay attention to this operations drop down menu because it might want you to do something that you don't want to do. Also, you've got something called new component. And new component is interesting, so everything you see on the browser that is one component, but that one component could be made up of lots of different parts it could get really busy okay so in that sense you might want to create a new separate component so for example my mug here the body of it the actual vessel that holds the liquid that is that could be one component i could create a new component for the handle and it means it has its own set it's the same set of rules but i can manipulate it separately from the body all right from this this body here Cheers. Okay, so I'm just going to say new body for a start. Okay, brilliant. Now, what happens is, is that when you tend to extrude or revolve from a sketch, it automatically turns it off, it makes it invisible. Why? I'm not really sure. I can only believe because sometimes they get in the way. But there are times when actually, I want that sketch on because I want to use it again. And that's exactly what we're going to do here, or I'm going to do. I'm going to use that same sketch again. Now, if I want to extrude it, I can do, but it's a bit of a problem because I've got these other surfaces here. If I select that, I could end up extruding. Oh, I know, I didn't mean to do that. Oh, that's peculiar. Mm. Oh, I don't cancel that. So you've got to be careful because if I select that face, potentially I could extrude that face. And that's when objects like this, they get in the way. And that's why you can turn them on and off. You can make them visible and invisible in the browser. And that's what's really important. All right. Look at that. I can also rotate it around, change the, you know, do really wacky stuff. Cancel that. So I'll turn off the body like the individual body. I'm not turning them off overall because it will give you an error message. All right, I'll show you that error message. But I am gonna extrude this again. Instantly, I'm trying to extrude something, but in the bottom it's one morning. Oh, the object that you're creating is not visible. Please toggle visibility in your browser. Okay, turn that on. Oh, there it is. Okay, so I'm creating another extrusion from that body, uh, from that sketch. But if I turn on that body free, which I should give a name, instantly Fusion thinks, ah, you want to remove material. And, it, and I know that because firstly, whenever anything is red, that denotes that material is going to be removed. Secondly, it, it says it in cut. There you go, it says it in cut which is quite handy because maybe that's exactly what I want to do. So if I stretch that downwards, yeah, it wants to cut into that as well. Okay. Well, that's good. I'm going to go okay. The net result of that though is that if I rotate that around, I have indeed created a recess within that extrusion. It's really cool. It's automatically done something called a Boolean difference. And I haven't had to do much to it. It's a real feature that I really like about Fusion. It's brilliant. Okay, so I've got a surface. I want to extrude that surface like I showed you. Or maybe I want to extrude that surface that exists within, within inside. Oh, no, I won't. Maybe I want to extrude that surface. So I want to extrude that surface up into it for whatever reason. So I'll go like that. And if I do that, Instantly, Fusion believes I want to join them together. 
but I might not want to join them together. I might want to create a new body. I might want to cut it, and there it is. It's cut it out, actually. It's cut something out. Alternatively, I might want to create an intersect. No target body of phone intersect. Right, of course, you would, wouldn't you? Oh, there we go. There it is. So I've gone all the way through it and it's created an intersect. All right, or cut. There we go. Cut a shaft all the way through it. So really be aware of that operations drop down menu. I can't labor it enough. Okay, now if you've got multiple bodies there, like I've got another body up there for a say, you can select which bodies you want to be affected and which bodies you don't. That's a fairly new feature, I think, but it's good. All right, so there you go. That's an extruded thing. But what about revolves? Well, revolves are different. Well, as you can see, with extrusions in solid mold, before I go on to that, if I turn those bodies off, it's all about this sketch. And the thing you need to notice about this sketch, it's shaded in pale blue. And what that means is, is that that is a closed sketch. It is not open. So if I went into maybe, if I went into sketch edit, if I got that line there and I just deleted it, like a vandal, if I go okay, well, where's, oh, well, those bodies theoretically shouldn't actually be there. It shouldn't be there at all, actually, but then that's a parametric. Oh, yeah, you can see unsaved. They're down at the bottom. There's something erroneous about them. All right. But the general gist of it is that in order to create closed solid extrusions, okay, they need to be closed sketches, as if like a circle is closed. There can't be no gaps. Because if you, if you have a gap, the only thing you can create are surfaces. And I, as I explained right near the beginning, surfaces have no discernible thickness, which is great if you're milling, like, like that, but not great if you're 3D printing things like that, which is the profile of my colleagues, chin and neck. Okay. So, what about revolves? I'm going to create a new sketch and the thing is I tend to create sketches or extrusions or any objects in the plane that they either are going to exist in or they're going to be manufactured in so for example this guy here I didn't create this vertically it was created horizontally because that's how it's machined although it exists it would exist in real life that way up so it's something to bear in mind um, in which orientation you're going to keep stuff in. But for here and now, don't worry about that. We can sort that out if it's all on the script or whatever. Okay, so I'm going to turn this sketch off. And for usually a revolve, I'm going to either select the, the front or the right hand plane. So let's toggle it around. Go, front. And I'm going to go to create sketch. There we go. So I'm in that front viewpoint, all right? Now, you can do this as well. I mean, it'd be good if you have a go. Um, so I'm gonna use a spine that I showed you earlier on, okay? Now the thing to bear in mind is that that spine is only gonna be one side of this. It's not gonna, it's gonna be top and bottom, it's gonna, traverse across this uh, this red line here, that X there, that X axis, but it's not gonna go beyond over the other side of this green axis here, which in actually is the Z axis, not the Y axis. It's not gonna go across there. And the reason being is, is because your, your, um, your um, revolve will fail. It will give an undesirable result. So using this spline tool here, in sketch mode, I'm gonna go fit spine tool, and I'm just gonna randomly anchor it and make the most beautifully curvaceous object, he says. All right? So if you need to, if I need to reiterate um, about how you use a spine tool, it is. It is, so select spine tool, 
I'm going to do that again. I'm going to fit point tall. Left click, left click, left click, left click, left click. Anchor, 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 anchor. All right. All right. And that's how you create that spine. I'm going to press escape on my keyboard to get out of that tool. And now I can adjust the paddles on it and make it whatever shape I, I deem fit. All right, just give it an adjustment. Lovely. Okay. Hello, Ian. Okay, so now the thing is, this is all well and good that I've created this curvaceous vector here. All right. But I want to revolve something into a solid. All right. I could do this in numerous ways. But the bottom line is, is that that is not a closed curve. It is an open curve. So there's two things, there's different ways I can go about it. One, I can create an offset. So I'll go to the offset, uh, offset tool and that's under modify. So you go to modify, drop that down, offsets near the bottom, offset. Boom. And then I'm gonna select that curve and I'll, I'll offset inside like so it doesn't matter by how much i think it looks okay like that that's fine i'm going to go okay it's still not a closed curve so in order to make it a closed curve i'm just going to use the line tool so i'll go to create find line at the top select that and at the end of objects that you create in sketch at the end of um at these vectors, there are these point, these points, and they're they're very handy. They are like points of reference. So I'm going to find with my crosshairs one of those points there. I found it. It's like, and it's I'm going to anchor to it using the left mouse button. There we go. Click that. And there it is. It's anchored. I'm going to find that other point which is directly above it, and it's at a right angle, so they're perpendicular. And I'm going to left click again. I've closed one end, but the tool is still active. I'm going to zoom out in my case and zoom back in and I'm going to do the same with the other end. There we go. And because it's shaded in that pale blue, it means it's closed. It means that I can extrude it. I can revolve it. And that's what we're going to do. All right. Is everyone kind of on the same page there. Now there is another way we can go about this and that might even be simpler. So maybe I'll, well, I'll go back and we'll have a look at that. Okay. Yeah. So, in this case, I'm, I'm fairly happy with that. So, I'm going to go to finish sketch. And once it's done it, it goes, reverts back to solid mode. I'm going to find this thing called revolve. And it's like six down from the top of the list. It says revolve. And the first thing it wants to know, well, it automatically presumes that we've got a, a um, we've got a profile. So in this toolbox, this dialog box here, it's where it says profile, it says one selected. Well, it's that. But if you've got lots of different profiles going on, maybe you don't want that selected. So, but I'll select it again. Now axes, I need to select that. So I'm going to click on that to highlight that. And the axes I've got is, well, the one I'm going to use is the Z axis. I don't have to use the Z axis. I could use another one. So if I put that in like, like perspective mode, I could maybe use the Y axis. Would I want to? No, it doesn't want me to do it because it will give an erroneous result because it's self intersecting. Will it let me do the, the X axis? Yeah, kind of. It doesn't like it because again, it's self intersecting. And it's something to understand. So when I created that revolve, I created it purposely to revolve around a particular axis, not another. All right. So let's say four, select axes, get rid of that. And I'm going to select in this case, the Z axis. Yeah, boom, there we go. There it is. I created that vessel. Now, 
I don't have to revolve it through 360 degrees. Yeah. If I say type, it says type here, I can say, well, actually, I'll, I might want an angle. And sure enough, I can select that angle there. Like that. Which is handy. So I might say, oh, I want it 180 degrees. I want half. I want half of whatever that is. And again, like extrusion, you have one sided, two sided, or symmetrical. So if I select symmetrical and then try that, it will move. Oh, yeah, it will do them both at the same time. Like so. Or if I do it two sided, it creates two paddles one for that way, one for that way. I can select them independently. It's great. It's great. But for intents and purposes, I'm just going to do one sided. And I'm going to set that angle for 180. Again, like with extrusion, we've got operation. And um, well, there's nothing to join it with unless I turn something on. Maybe it intersects. Okay. I mean, that extrusion is, but that revolver is massive. But you know, I've got a little briquette there somewhere. It's floating in midair. So it's doing nothing. Anything else interacting? No, it's so it's so colossal. Doesn't matter. Okay, so I'm just going to go new body, and I'm going to go. Okay. All right. So I've created that. It's using this kind of process. That's how you can make things like vessels. Okay. It's how you can make things like lampshades. All right. It's how I made. That, that plant pot, I used that process, a little bit more complicated than that, and the, and the, and the source of that it sits on, okay? It's very, very versatile. You can do some very interesting stuff with it, all right? Okay, so, brilliant. So we've looked at, um, there we go for time, so that's plant, yeah, cool, we're good. Okay, so we've looked at um, extrusions and revolves. There's something else, and it's called a sweep. And sweeps are really quite interesting. Now, yes, there are a lot of other tools within that solid create toolbox, but I've got to be careful about really what you're gonna what you're gonna do. Um, and how much time there is, because um, we could do something called lofting, but that means setting up lots of planes of view and different profiles. It is actually a bit of a faff within Fusion, so I'm not going to show you it to you um, as such. So what we're going to do is we're going to do something called sweep. Now the thing to understand about when you're doing things like sweep, you have to not only have one sketch. One sketch is not enough. You need two at least two sketches okay so i'm just going to hide this body all right and we're going to have a look at sweep we'll have a quick look at sweep okay so first i need to create a sketch and the sketches that we're going to create one of them has to be a closed sketch because we want to make a solid and the other sketch has to be open Okay, so how it works is that you've got something called a rail, and that's the open sketch. And the rail essentially is what it says. So you can imagine like a train or a tram, it follows the path of the rail. If you've got a handrail on a stairwell, you hold that to guide you up and down the stairs. It guides your path, your direction. That's exactly how it works within Fusion. But then you've got the profile, and the profile is like this extrusion. It's like that profile there, what you want to traverse around that rail, okay? And so that has to be closed, unless you're making a surface, but we're not. Okay, so, so, we're gonna create two sketches. One is in the top, top plane, okay? There it is, I'm going to click on that. And my rail, your rail could be a straight line, but there's little point in that, that's just an extrusion. 
a conventional direction, what single direction extrusion. I'm going to use a spine tool, of course. So there we go. I'm back in sketch mode, it's highlighted in blue and underlined in with a blue line. And then create. I've got spline, fit point spline, and I'm going to start at that date and point in the middle. And I'm just going to left click, left click, left click. I'm not going to do anything too radical. Because it might not like it, you know. Spines are a bit, um, rails can be, um, sweeps can be a bit funny. All right. Now, I've noticed that my sweep here, my path is coming off at that angle there. So it's following it around. So I want to create a sketch that is relatable to that, i.e. at more or less a right angle. It doesn't have to be, but just for all intents and purposes to make it easy for us, at a right angle. So I'm just going to change that to a perspective point of view so I can see what's going on. All right, and I think that's the front plane there. So I'm going to go new sketch. Oh, I'm going to escape this sketch. And I'm going to call it rail. Oop. Get out of that again. And then I'm going to go to create sketch again. No, I'm not because it's, it's done sketch I didn't want to create. Right, there we go. And now I'm going to select that path, that plane, that approximates like a right angle, perpendicular relationship to that rail that I've, I've drawn, i.e. the start of that rail. Not It could be anywhere amongst that rail, but the start of it. So I'm going to press that button there. And here, you can draw any kind of shape you want as long as it's closed. But in this case, I'm going to draw a polygon. So I'm going to create. I'm going to go to polygon, which is uh, the fifth tool down. Doesn't matter which one you create. Well, it's either circumscribed or inscribed, or you're circumscribed. I'm going to find the center on that date and point. I'm going to left click to activate it. I'm going to drag it out. I'm not going to make it too big. Well, actually, I don't know how big that vector is. I mean, it's, that's, that, that spline is massive, it's meters. So I'm going to say, I don't know, whatever, 100. And then I'm going to give it a number of sides. And I don't know, nine. Nine sounds nice. Oh, no, oh, hang on. Wrong, wrong. All kinds of wrong. All right, there we go. Highlight that and give that nine. Well, oh, maybe seven. Seven. And then press enter. Okay, so we've got the two sketches. And that's how they relate to each other, yeah? There we go. Brilliant. So that one I'm going to call profile in the browser menu. Ugh. Now, this is how we do this. So we go to create. So it's back in a solid mode, highlighted in blue, underlined in blue. Let's create. I'm going to go to sweep. And the thing is, it's got single path. There is only one path here. We're going to use that. So the profile. First, it wants the profile. Well, that's the profile. I'm going to select that. Secondly, it wants the path. So in that dialog box, I'm going to go to path, select that, and then I'm going to select that path. But boom, there it goes. It's literally just traced it all the way around that crazy spine. Okay. Now under it, sure, we've got distance here. And it's done it as a factor. All right, so one is like 100% of its length. If I said I want it as uh, 0 0.5, it's done half the length. A bit of a weird, curious way of doing it, actually, but it works. But I could drag that arrow around, you see, and just trace it around, like so. Now, not only that, is that we've got a taper angle. Yeah, we can put a taper on it. That taper will be quite small, though, I reckon. Oh, or maybe quite large at that point. So it started off at, at its normal scale, normal size, and it's just it's got bigger at a, at a one degree interval all the way along. So it's, it's turned out to be probably actually quite large. Interesting. 
Not only that, if I just set that back to zero, that taper angle, we've got something called a twist angle. A twist angle is interesting. So I could say, oh, I want it five, well, 30 degrees. How's it going to do it? And believe it or not, that profile has now twisted 30 degrees along the length of that. You can barely notice it. So maybe I'll say, oh, well, I'm going to change it to like 180. There you go. That's much more noticeable. Change it to 360. I think mean, it's really good stuff that you can do this. All right, really good. Then you've got things like orientation, where it's perpendicular. So what that means is, is that that profile, no matter where it is along that path, it will always be held at a right angle to it, like so. It doesn't have to be like that. It can be parallel. But the results may fail because it just can't do it because it, like, it's got too tight a radius. So be aware of that. Oh, I'll drag you all the way down here. Oh, there we go. So there's a bit of it, but not much. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't like it. So I'm going to say that that is perpendicular. Oh, look at that distance. Beautiful. Super twisty. Yeah, cool. Oops, I didn't mean to press enter, but there you go. Oh, there we go. Okay, so that sweeps. All right. Now, the thing is, with sweeps or anything that we've created, these can be modified. So I'm going to talk a bit about modification. Okay, so I'll turn that body off. In fact, I'm going to name it because I'm being slack. But I don't sweep. What's this guy here? Revolve. And that's an extrusion. I'll just call that extrusion. Okay. Right. Now, for example, if I turn that extrusion back on, you can see it's got edges. In fact, actually, I'll turn the sweep back on because um, it's, it's just more interesting. Now, we can do a number of things to this. So under the Modify tab, we've got things like push-pull. Well, push-pull is the first one we'd have a look at. And I'll say, oh, I'm going to select this surface. But that surface extends all the way around at some kind of twisted angle. But I'm going to drag it up. It might not like it. It's not going to like it, is it? It's going to say, no way, Jose. Or it's going to be too much. Oh. Okay, what are we looking at? While it's doing that. While it's making it up. So, oh. yeah, no, it doesn't like it. So, I mean, an example of where I've used a sweep is this thing here. And this is um, some kind of Mobius sweep of a solid. Now, a Mobius strip is a strip that only, uh, it's, uh, it only has one surface. And uh, yeah, it didn't like that. Cool. Yeah, God, fine, all right. But if you were to create this using Fusion, you cannot create this through one profile, okay? You have to, I had to create three profiles and draw that, not three profiles, three rails, and draw the profile around those three rails, a given degree, seriously. Yeah. So here's a good example of where fusion can, it's not going wrong, it can be a bit timely. So my laptop is really quite a powerful machine, but by trying, but by trying to do that, um, offset face by push pull doesn't like it. It's struggling like mad. All right, you're going to come across these kind of things. If they do happen, they are a wee bit frustrating. All right, cool. All right, Is there any questions regarding solids while we're waiting for this? I did it. <laughs> I can believe it. I can believe it. So the first thing I'm going to ask is, uh, well, the first thing I'm going to ask is everyone created 
at least one solid. If you haven't created a solid, you don't have to necessarily make yourself be known. It, um, it'd be ideal if you have, even if it's simple. And the reason being is, is that you're going to need that solid to export. At this point, I'd just like to say that um, you don't have to have, as Owen said, anything special. It could be just a box mm. if you're struggling. All it is is, is, a, is a vehicle to look into um, uh, the, the, the software for 3D printing um, for, for next week. If you like, Owen, I could share mine and just do a very simple um, Philip. rotate and, and shell, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Well, this Shall is I do great. that? I can just, share, if you just stop sharing, I'll share mine for a minute. And then hopefully yours will be back online. Hopefully you'll be able to see that. Yeah, I can see that, man. Cool. Um, so I'm just going to do a very quick, um, just while Owens is rebooting. I'm just going to start some something from scratch. So as Owen suggested, I'm going to go straight up to sketch and create a sketch. And I'm going to choose one of the side um, uh, planes there. Um, and I'm looking, this one's the front one there. So I'm going to choose this one. And I'm just going to make a very quick shape. I'm going to go to uh, my create and go to spline and fit point spline and I'm going to start kind of offset from the center there and I'm just going to draw any kind of shape really and I'll finish and you can just see off the top of my page there's a little tick in the green box there if I just hover over that and click on it I've got my spline there I'm going to go and draw two straight lines now I'm just going to go up to line I'm going to start from the end of my line and don't get mixed up by the way between the green one which we can move to change the um to change the curve and the white one there which is the end of the line so i'm going to start on that white one left click and then just move to the center and click again and i've got a line there again i, I could either click the tick or i'm going to go straight up actually and i'm using my mouse now to kind of navigate forwards and backwards and i'm going to go straight up past the end of that one. I'm just going to go straight up and left click again and then click my little tick there. Now I'm going to make another line and zoom in again using my mouse and not the green one because that's I can move that around to change my line. It's this one here, the, the white one. I'm going to left click on that and go straight and I'm going to cross actually that line and then click. Now I could if I was Owen, um, I'd be very particular and actually uh, trim these lines here. But in actual fact, I don't need to, um, because you, as you can see, the, 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 the kind of uh, blue area in the middle here tells me that this is closed. So I can actually just go up to select. So, because uh, I'm still in kind of drawing mode, go to select. And I think I will, I'll be a bit more professional. I'll get rid of these two lines here that are overlapping. And you can see the pair of scissors and modify, which is trim. And I can just trim that one and that one. So that those lines are gone, okay. It gives me a warning that a constraint has disappeared, but I'm gonna ignore that because I don't like constraints anyway. Right, I'm gonna just click finish sketch. I'm going to grab this plane here and I'm going to revolve that just as Owen showed us to make a solid. So I'm going to go up to revolve in the create menu there and I'm going to follow what it says at the top. Now I've already selected my profile, but if we hadn't, if we hadn't selected it, we start from the top, select our profile, go down to axis, which is the next one. And I'm going to choose the blue line there and hopefully when we come to axis let me see if this will work I'm going to cancel and start again because i think i might have made a mistake there i'm going to go to revolve profile axis is the blue one and there is my solid which has just appeared i'm going to leave it at 360 and click ok and while I'm here, I'm just going to show you very quickly one of the modifications we can quickly make to a solid. And that's in modify here, one of them is called shell. It's one, two, three, fourth down there. 
I'll hit shell and again we get this dialog box that we're used to and it's asking me to select a face and of course the top face there is easy to select and then you can just type in one that's a one millimeter thickness or I can go back and do two and that's a bit thicker there and I'm just going to click OK and what you have now of course is a, a vessel a solid which has been hollowed I'm just going to check with Owen that he's um he's back online back online you mm -hmm. are excellent so I'm just going to come back now and stop I like, I like, I like that vessel <laughs> so hopefully I've stopped sharing now yeah man sharing is caring and you can uh, take mm -hmm. over again okay right so I mean, I've had to start, I've had to do something from scratch because I, I suppose uh, fusion full stop, that's fine. That is fine. <clears throat> so what I've got here, um, what I've got here is a form. And the thing is, when you create three-dimensional forms is that, uh, as Ian showed you, you can modify them by doing the shell structure, which is, which is a really handy thing to do, especially if you're interested in making pots or seeing what they would look like as vessels. But you can also do things like fillets or champers. And a fillet is where like, you take an edge like that, and I'm going to give it a radius, like so. And that is a fillet. It's rather nice. Now, okay, that's just one edge, but what if I want to add other edges? So let's just um, let's just okay that. No, nope, not okay that. Let's get rid of that. I would select maybe all of these edges in one go, and it's using the left mouse button. And then I could just do them all at the same time. I can only push this arrow in one direction though, and sure enough, I have a filleted edge. Kind of, it doesn't do these edges. There's limitations to what it will do or how it will do it. Okay, so that's filleting. And filleting is very, very uh, useful, particularly as I say, if you've got things like an internal corner um, and you're 3D printing something. So, for example, I've got this thing here. This is a bracket that fits um, the idea is it's part of a shelf, it fits plank, lim and wood into it. But the, this edge here is filleted, and the reason why that's filleted is to enable for me to easily slide in that piece of material. Um, I couldn't put any fillets elsewhere because sometimes placing fillets is not as straightforward as you think. But fillets tend to give a really nice finish to stuff, okay? But they also have a functionality as well, particularly if you're making molds, okay? Right, fine, I've done that. Now, I'm just going to shell this just like Ian did because I like that. So I'm just going to do that, give that a shell. Let go. Beautiful. Okay, we're going to use this in a minute. So, where are I up to? So, that's that. Fine, combine. Okay, so moving on from solid, hopefully, you've all created a solid. If you haven't created a solid, don't worry too much, really. But at least have a go at creating like a square or a shape in sketch mode and then extruding it. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It doesn't have to be like this uh, pommel horse that I seem to have created. Okay. Now, often there is another way of creating things. I'm going to hide that because we'll use that later. And it is the form button. And it's this purple tool here. And this is found under the set of solid tools, okay? It doesn't have its own subsection. Well, it does, but it's hidden. It's a bit like Sketch in a way. And the reason being is, is because it uses what are otherwise a unique set of processes. So if, if we click on that, it says create form, instantly all those other toolbar, toolboxes, they've disappeared, you know, solid, um surface etc form is all by itself we can create forms from sketches create sketch 
but I want you to explore primitives. Now, if your screen is cluttered with things that you've created, make sure you go into the browser and just turn them off so you can't see them, okay? All right. As you also might know, it's because I've gone into form, those bodies that I created earlier on, they've, that, that, they've disappeared from the browser. Yeah, they still exist, but they cannot exist in this plane, more easily anyway. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go to create, drop down menu, and the create menu primarily exists, within here exists primitives. At the bottom, yes, we've got things like extrude, revolve, sweep, lock from sketches that you can create, but we have things like primitives. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna select sphere. Now, like, you know, there's a toolbox, there's a dialog box that's appeared. Now, like sketch and like solid and like surface, which we, have, which we won't look at, it wants you to select a plane to draw on. And um, I'm gonna use the front, I always use the top, I'm gonna use front. Okay, now it hasn't, like, like selecting a primitive within solid, it hasn't changed its viewpoint. It will just keep it into some kind of perspective viewpoint that you, you've placed it in. But I'm gonna place that on the date and point in the middle. I'm gonna left click, and then I'm just gonna drag it out so it's bigger. 100 millimeters should do it well. And I've got a globe, I've got a sphere, a sphere here. Now, in this dialog box, all right, there's several things going on. Again, you've got operation at the bottom. All you can do, though, is create a new body. The only reason is, is because there are no other bodies of this type created yet. But that would change with the more bodies you create, okay? Fine. We've got longitudinal faces, where you can put in any number. If I put in 32, which would be really quite a lot, you can see how it's changed, how that sphere has been divided. Yeah. If I say the latitude, so there's the longitudinal faces. If I say the latitudinal faces, it's got eight. I could say, well, maybe I'll just do it six. No, don't do it six. Yeah, don't be silly. Maybe I'll say that's 32 as well. I would veer away from this just for the time being. I'm going to select. Eight, eight in each. Now you've got a tab here, it says symmetry. You can have min, mirror or circular. And it's interesting because what that means is if I have mirror symmetry, if I, it says uh, 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 length symmetry, width symmetry. So if I click that, there you go, there's the length symmetry. When it comes to modifying this, because it has got quite a large, it's got a larger selection of modifying tools than it has creating tools. All right. If I modify something on one side of that line, it will affect it on the other. So that's why it's there. But we could also click width symmetry and height symmetry. So basically, if I change something within this area, it will change something within all the others. All right. Really handy. Very handy if you want to make things that have, uh, I don't know, well, yeah, symmetry. I'm going to just have length symmetry there. Or maybe width. I don't know. Then I'm going to go OK. There we go. So let's put that back into the viewpoint. So there we go. There it is. OK, big deal. I've created a sphere that's got lots of segments in it. But these segments can be modified. These edges can be modified. And where they intersect, these vertices, they're kind of vertices, they can be modified too. And how you do that is things like edit form. So I'm going to select modify. The top, right at the top is edit form. I'm going to go boom. There we go. It says T spline entity. These are T spines. All right. I don't really want to get into the difference between T spines, breps, which is uh, boundary representations, nerves, which is. Uh, non-uniform uh, rational boundary or meshes. I'm not going to talk about, yeah, right? We're not going to discuss that. It gets too complicated. Um, but I'm going to select, say, that point there. Now, once I've selected it, 
I've got these arrows and I if I select that up arrow I could just pull that up hey look at that I've literally just molded that as if it was a piece of clay but because that symmetry is there it's also done it on the other side as well right pretty cool yeah maybe I want to make push that inwards there we go we could push that inwards as well as if someone's grabbed the ball and deflated it by pushing it all right alternatively well you could do that upwards and you could also rotate it i mean it's a pretty powerful modeling tool and the thing is the thing that people like about this it is so hands-on because if you try to create these kinds of things in conventional solid modeling mode using sketches and primitives you, yeah you're going to have a real hard time about it so this enables the creation of shapes and objects that you wouldn't easily be able to create in another way so it's really worth mentioning because i think you get like quite a bit of versatility out of it and if anything if you didn't create a three-dimensional form within that's when i was talking about solids have a go at creating a three-dimensional form in this and then modifying it obviously a word of warning don't go too mad because we do want you to save it as an stl file now uh, you can drag stuff off to the side look at that do all sorts yeah it's quite interesting so all right i'm quite happy with that so i'm going to go okay i don't like the orientation though but don't worry about that i want to go okay but i'm going to do that again this time i might select i don't know i'm going to select a whole face and sure enough if i push that in it will push it in symmetrically as well it's really really good i think it's good all right you know what i mean amazing Now, Fusion 360, if you didn't know, is a piece of software that borrows lots of features from other bits of software that are created by Autodesk. So this would have come from um, 3ds Max or Maya, and they are specific to things like animation. You see, it's really, really cool. Okay, so I want you to have a play around with that. Now, there are other tools, of course, available to you. So I've got all these edges. Yeah, I, was, I, was, I resisted the temptation of having 32 different, like 32 by 32 surfaces because it kind of gets a bit complicated. However, you can remove surfaces. You can merge an edge. So here in modify that drop down list. So it's uh, six from the top, merge, merge edge, uh, edge one group. Oh, hang on a minute. Maybe I've got the wrong. Yeah, I've got the wrong tool, haven't I? Silly sausage. And where is it? Merge edge, insert edge, bridge, erase, weld vertices. That's not it. Unweld edges, crease, crease, bevel, smooth. It's smooth. No, it's, yeah. No. Oh, yeah, maybe. Smoothing's good for, yeah, it hasn't really done that. I mean, it has. It's quite subtle make really organic shapes with it but again you can actually insert edges so for example if I put an edge here yeah it wants to insert an edge up there or down below right there it doesn't want to go too far though so I might put it there so it's about that edge there so if I put that there for example Surgeon precision, both both sides, symmetrical, simple, exact, whatever. Let's have a simple, single-sided. Okay. I've put an edge in there, so now you can modify. You can modify that on its own, or even the points that I've created with it. Okay. 
form is a really fun tool to use. However, if you try to bring in your own um, files into it, it can get a bit complicated, it can get, throw a hissy fit. So just be warned about that. So now create, has everyone created something in form? Oh, see, it doesn't like that, look at that, ooh, quite ugly. You have trouble 3D printing that, but hey, why not? we we'll use that. Okay, so has everyone had a look at form? Has everyone created something in form? And if you haven't, fair enough, don't worry, you've got a week, but if you have, that's great. All right, the bottom line is, is once you've finished, I could just go finished form. Uh, T-spine, photo convert, continue model will not be screwed. Oh. All right, so I'm going to undo that. Spoil sport. Oh, now I'll do it. Now, the thing is, I've gone okay. It's come out of that form um, toolbox. It's gone back into solid. Okay, but there it is. There's my form, form two. Wonderful. Very nice. So you create some very, very tactile looking organic shapes. Okay. Now there's a tab on this bar up the top. It's called inspection. And inspection is interesting. It's actually really important because sometimes you might have a, a body like this, for example, and there's no dimensions on it. And you would use the inspection tool not only to check dimensions, but you can check other stuff. So if I scroll along to the right to inspection, open that up and you've got measurement, interference, we haven't got nothing. Interference is when you've got like two bodies that they might be close, they might intersect each other, they might not at all, okay? Like if you've got a peg in a hole, for example, you might wanna check the kind of interference it has. Um, interference is really important when making certain objects. Oop, where's it gone? Uh, curvature comb analysis, zebra analysis. Let's select that. There we go. You can save that if I if I if I lock those stripes. Oh look at that. It's wacky, it's out there, but we're not going to use that. So mainly it's used for inspecting lengths. So if I go to measure, there's not much going on in this, this dialog box, apart from select faces, edge, vertex, select body. Well, I could go select body, or select the whole body. But I need to select another body. There's nothing to reference it against. Select component, yes, this is a component, but again, it's like a whole body. Ah, oh, there's another body under it, I won't do that. Yep, 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 yep. But instead, I want to measure faces. I don't know the length at the bottom, so I would just select that while it's in this mode. While it's in select face edge vertex mode, I'll go here. There we go. And at the bottom of this dialog box, it gives me the length 69.974 uh, millimeters. It's quite accurate. Maybe I want to measure this length as well. I want to measure that distance. And it tells me along there, perpendicular, so imagine a line running down the center, it's given me that dimension, okay? Now you can see how I did that. I selected one edge and then I selected another. Cool, all right, that's nice. If I wanna measure other things, there's a little like refresh button there. It says restart selection. Maybe I wanna measure that edge. And it gives me the length of that line. It won't give me, it won't give me its uh, radius, because it might not actually be a true radius. That's probably just an arc that is through like an elliptical arc. Yeah, you know, there it is. And it didn't give me that measurement because it was on the side. But if I click that surface, it tells me what the radius and the diameter is. So a measure is a really, really handy thing to have, but it differs from sketch dimension because with measure, you're not changing anything. All you're doing, you're making, it's giving you reference. It's telling you how big something is. 
<laughs> no. Now, other than that, in expect, in um, inspect, you've got things like um, section analysis. Section analysis is good. He says. So if I select, say, that plane, I can't see it. That plane there. There you go. I've got. It's given me a cross section of what that looks like on the inside. And that's really handy because sometimes you need to know what stuff looks like on the inside. I would, it would have been really quite, it wouldn't have been easy for me to see that radius of that internal fillet there. I wouldn't have been able to see it. But in the cross section, I can. Okay. Show hatching, I can turn it off. You can change the color. You can say, oh, I want a custom color, like that leery, loud pink. Or maybe not. But also, you've got an arrow, so we can see how that section changes as we move that arrow, all right? It also has a rotational com command there. So things like this, cross sections are really handy. But it doesn't end there, of course. Why would it end there? And the reason why I say that is it 25 degrees out, yeah, something like that? Looks all right. I mean, it looks a bit skew with actually. So if I say, yeah, okay, select color card, it's gonna go okay. In the browser, I've got an analysis box. And you think, oh God, well, how do I get rid of that? Well, I just turn it off. That analysis function doesn't really do anything apart from creates a cross section. The thing is, though, sometimes you want to use the cross section to create a sketch. That's called projection. So, for example, if I went into so create sketch, I go here. There it is. And in the sketch, in that drop-down sketch menu, I was going to talk about projection, but this is a good example where cross sections work. It says geometry. All right. Well, maybe. Yeah. There we go. It's there. Is geometry you can't see really what's going on but i'm selecting that cross section in a manner of speaking project link no don't project link i'm glad you're back and if i turn that off that um analytical view off and the body because that's in the way yeah there we go i've got that cross section it's quite handy to have it's very handy okay so that's inspection covered. I mean, it is very brief. We're going to look at something called rendering. Okay, we've got 10 minutes to look at rendering, and then finally, we're going to see about how you're going to save your files. Okay, now I've got a favorite thing that I use for rendering. Where is it? First projects, first projects, theoretically, uh, recent projects, new projects, recent projects, recent, my recent data, data. F, FP Pagali. What's FP Pagali? FP Pagali is this. It's a shoe. This is a shoe. I did not create this shoe. I 3D printed it. This came off Thingiverse, and Thingiverse does really exist as an online resource for three dimensional designs. Thingy, T H I N G I B E R S E dot com. All sorts of stuff. Now I've got a shoe here. Um, why have I got a shoe? Because it's a really good demonstrative tool for many, many things, particularly if you're interested in fashion and costume. But in this case, I love to use it for the rendering exercise. Okay, now I could use this object here. In fact, maybe I will, because it's unfair for me to use, thank you Ian, it's unfair of me to use an object like Pigali when I should be using an object like this. In fact, no, I'm going to use Kigali. You can use your own objects if you wish. So to, do, to select rendering, I'll go to that drop down menu. I'll go to render. It's third from the bottom. So the drop down menus in design, right in the left hand corner, generative design, render. OK. Now, generally speaking, the default setting for render is steel. It doesn't look very steely, but again, let's have a look at what this is going on. It's got its own little tab render. There's no other things like solid or whatever going on there. Okay. 
it doesn't show sketches, but it shows bodies. And in this case, it will show mesh body one. It's a mesh. I shall talk about that briefly. Now we've got appearance, scene settings, decal, and texture map controls. The ones we're just going to look at, we're going to look at scene, appearance and scene setting. Also, we've got in canvas rendering. Now we can turn that off. We've got in canvas rendering, in canvas render settings. That's good, fast. We love it fast. Okay. And we've got capture image. We've also got this teapot here. Um, I've got something here that says rendering key shot nine. I don't have key shot nine because my colleague Ian Hankey's got it. But I'm not going to render in that because it's a different bit of software. But we could just, I could just render that and save that design, that rendered view. We can download it. You can save it locally onto your laptop, right? First things first, though, let's have a look at its appearance. So I'm going to hit that color wheel and my render settings, my, I've got at the top here body components, that's the body. I could use faces, but I'm not going to do that. Tend, you tend to use faces for things like decals. And a body's component, there's the default satin steel. Imagine a shoe made of steel, no thank you. And you've got library. Now, please note that my library is extensive. And the reason why it's so extensive, because every time there's, a, there's libraries to download, I download them of course, because I'm greedy for the stuff. Now, I'm going to select liquid. I like liquid. You could select glass. There is a glass setting there. But I select liquid because it gives a better whatever. I'm going to go swimming pool. And I'm going to drag that. I literally, just there's a hand, um, hand uh, icon there. And to drag, you left click, drag it on there, and slam it right on that shoe. There we go. And then I'm going to hit the in canvas render button. So as you can see, that's rendering real time. At the bottom, it's got an elapsed time at the bottom right. Iteration number zero. I don't even know. Yeah, hey, look, it's slowed everything down. It's even slowed the camera down on my processor. All right. Oops. But as you can see, the reason why I use this setting swimming pool because it does give a really nice render as if it's made of acrylic. Okay, well that's great. I'm gonna turn oh, where's my mask on? I'm gonna stop that. All right, it's still taken on that shape, but it's as basic as hell. In fact, maybe if I go to the settings, limit resolution, yeah, let's say advance. Not for you. Okay, fine. All right, so the next one is the scene setting. Scenes are quite restrictive in Fusion. It's annoying. Okay, you've got a lot of Fusion, then you've got attached to design. Yeah, there's not. I mean, when, when I scroll down and I look at it, it's like, yeah, it's almost as if they're designed for placing a car there or something like that. It's not really ideal. So I'm going to say Plaza. I'm going to drag that and just dump that somewhere and then wait. And sure enough, it's reflected in there. I can see it's reflected in the shoe, but where is Plaza gone itself? I'm surprised. Settings. And that, the reason why I can't see it, but it's reflected, is because you have to go into settings. The background is set as a solid color, which I could change to anything. No, don't like that. Brilliant. Fast fusion again with like 10 minutes to go. Amazing. We will be returning to rendering though in the um, mesh mixer one. So, okay, so you got a solid. That didn't really work out so well, that render setting there, but which is a shame. But rendering in fusion is really versatile and it's free. Uh, so, all right, so we've got a sketch, we've got a sketch. I'm going to create that model, push, 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 done. Oh, you know, they say about live television. So I've got this spline here. Close that. 
going to create a solid from it because, yeah, beautiful. There we go. Okay. So you've got a solid. You want to create an STL. Well, the first thing, what is a mesh? A mesh is basically, you can imagine if you've got some net curtain or net and you draped it over this object, it basically turns all these surfaces into polygons. Now the question is, what is a polygon? A polygon is a, a, a multi-sided object that has more, at least, it has at least three sides. And within Fusion or any kind of CAD work we do, the kind of polygons we deal with are either three or four sided. The only time we'd ever generate something that has a five sided polygon is if you've got this point, something like here, at the top of your nose, between your eyes. If you scan someone or create someone in a bit of software like you're trying to emulate their face, that would be like a five-sided polygon because it's how everything has to mesh to it. They're really horrible to work with though, I'll tell you that. Okay, so the reason why we need meshes is because machines like 3D printers that create things like Pagali here, um, they need to be able to read that data. And so what happens is, is um, you create this mesh and each point, each vertices where these polygons intersect forms a point. And right at the beginning, I was saying that points in, in, in the Cartesian axes in that space, they have three numbers and they are references, whether they're positive or negative, yeah? Right? And machines like 3D printers, and uh, mini machines, the inbuilt software for those, they read that information and then they can plot toolpaths or directions of how things work, layer by layer by layer by layer, okay? And that's why we have meshes. Now, to create a mesh in Fusion, you need the browser and you need the body. Whatever body you've got in browser, it doesn't matter. So I'm, I'm, in my case, I'm gonna open up the browser there's body one here. I'm going to right click on that. And I've got a whole gamut of um, different things I can do. Move, copy, copy to move to group, texture, appearance. But this is the one I want. It's saved as STL. And STL, or dot STL, because it is a file extension, a file format, it, uh, it's short for stereolithographic or stereolithographic. Stereolithography, if I can get my get the word out of my mouth. Okay. So you click that button and instantly a dialog box appears. Okay. Now when we do this, it doesn't output it, it actually outputs a file that you would save locally on your either on your desktop, somewhere on your laptop or your computer. It doesn't save it in the cloud. So I've already had that body pre-selected. First thing you've got to note, you've got format, you've got binary or you've got ASCII. Do not save it as ASCII. ASCII files are huge. They, have, they, they are really big in terms of memory. Uh, in, yeah, in terms of RAM and ROM memory. They're really big. We use binary, they're perfectly good, okay? Preview mesh. Well, there's the mesh there, preview. If I turn that body off, oh, that's a shame. You can see that these polygons that primarily are three-sided um, objects, even stretched out ones, they, they have totally enrobed, It's a good word, enrobed that object. Now here it tells us the number of triangles. That's polygons. And that's uh, 14,644. That's good. That's low. It's low. You're going to have problems if you've got a polygon count or something like in excess of a million. Okay. And the reason being is, is that you've got to understand that our machines, they, are, they work to a resolution. So you can have a really high resolution design, but the 3D printer will be like, yeah, I'm going to print that. It's still going to be a bulky, blocky thing. So bear that in mind. So we tend to aim for a resolution of uh, no more than 300,000 polygons. 66 is a good number. 66,000, not 66, it'll be blocky. So here we've got things like refinement, 
high, medium, low, custom. So if I got custom, surface normal, actually I don't want that, I want low. And there we go, less polygons. It means if we were to 3D print that, it would pick up those edges. It really would. They would have, like, you would 3D print an object that has got faces. And that's great, because sometimes that's an effect you might want to get. But I want it high. Yep. Okay, so you could output to a 3D print utility. We're not going to bother that. That's something that um, Ian's going to discuss next week. But generally, you go, okay. And sure enough, it's opened up a save as um, window. To, to somewhere on my laptop. Wherever you put it, make sure you put it somewhere where you can find it. And the reason being is, is because Ian wants these STL files for next week. Well, you will need an STL file for next week. Okay, so it doesn't matter what kind of object you created, however hideous or even beautiful it might be, save it as an STL file, if it's a form or a solid. If you've had problems, then we can deal with that early next week and uh, the uh, very, very early part of the session next week. Okay, so I wouldn't normally call it body one. I am really, really, really fussy when it comes to naming files. Okay, exceptionally fussy. I'm this kind of fussy. Okay. How you name your files is up to you, but like being organized with Infusion, do yourself a favor and don't call it body one or untitled one. Because if you sent me a file that was called untitled one, I'd send it back and say, that's not good enough. I need more. Yeah, I don't have to name it for you. you know, it's bad practice. How can you ever, we all have digital cameras and there's like millions of photos that are called the image and a number. It means nothing. And then you just save it. All right, I digress. It's as simple as that, okay? If, though, you want to save a DXF file, a .dxf file, that's a drawing exchange file. And that was something developed by um, AutoCAD, well, Autodesk for AutoCAD, which is a product of theirs, okay? You know, we'll just hit half past, Owen. That's all right, mate. No rush, no rush. <laughs> this will take two minutes, two seconds, if that. I want to hide that body, and it's all about the sketches. I want to find that sketch. Now, like saving an STL, if you right-click on that, there's something there. So save as DXF. I want you to do that as well. Find a sketch, any sketch that you've done, right-click on it, and find that thing that says save as DXF file. And again, give it a name. Right, so I'm going to save on a desktop and I'm going to call oh, horribly, I'm going to call it shape because then I'm going to delete it like as soon as I come across it again. And I'm going to go like that. That's it. That's it. And that DXF file, that drawing, can then be taken into Inkscape or Illustrator or Coral Draw or any kind of bit of 2D design software. You might even be able to get it into Photoshop, I think. I'm not sure about that. And that is it. That's uh, the first session done. Any questions? Any questions or feedback as well. You know, we, we, we like to know, you know, if the pace is right or if you've had any problems following and so on. Yeah. Uh, remember that this has been recorded. And so you can go for it all over again if you wish. The other thing to bear in mind about Fusion 360 is that there is a huge, huge wealth of online resources for it. You only have to go on YouTube, the how-tos, literally from the, even the most basic. But you'll also have someone else droning on, like I've been droning on for the last three hours. Okay, So just bear that in mind. I, you know, my attention span for such things is limited, to say the least. So next week, Ian's going to be looking at Cura and Slicer and um, 3D fabrication. He's going to be running it. I'm going to be Ian next week. Now, one last thing before we go. This, this course is, like, it is the most basic course. And if you want to do other courses within Smart Citizen Program, you have to do it. 
if I wanted to do other advanced courses in smart system program, even though I run them, I would have to do this too. But this will signpost you to all sorts of other stuff that are a lot more advanced. Okay, so if your if um, if your knowledge of such things is greater or growing, um, you could be doing level three, part two, or whatever. I don't even know what it's called, but it's what I run with cuddles on a Tuesday, for example, and it is really more advanced. You'd be left, you basically left alone to your own devices. Simple as. All right, and that's about it. Yeah, we're, re we're really sympathetic to how complicated um, CAD software is. We all started knowing nothing. I mean, we've all been born, never mind, but we know how steep that learning curve is. It helps if you've got an object or an idea in mind and you're trying to try and recreate that in the virtual world. It's a good start or emulate things like cups and mugs. Hi, Amanda. I can see that question. Is a problem the edges faces across? And yes, it is. Um, as Owen showed you in that um, sculptural bit, you can actually kind of push something to the point where one goes through the other, and that's a physical impossibility. So that's going to be a problem when it comes to 3D printing. So we do have to be aware, and it's a little bit like, you know, I did the shell first, and then Owen showed you how to do the, um, the filleting. It's always better to do the filleting on a solid first and then shell it, mm. because sometimes if you if you put a, if you uh, shell something and then try and put a fillet on, it's a physical impossibility because it goes through space that isn't there. So even though we're working in CAD, even though we're working in this kind of virtual reality world, we still have to kind of uh, stick to what's physically possible. Yeah, very much so. And there, there are certain features in CAD software like filleting that are actually problematic. I mean, Fusion's pretty good for filleting, but if you were using things like Rhino, it's a real pain in the neck, actually. Suddenly you end up with just surfaces. Explosion of guttering. <laughs> no one wants that, it's rubbish. <laughs> we love Rhino. Well, I think that was a great first session, everyone. So uh, thanks ever so much for coming.